Remnant from the Ashes truly does feel, to quote Polygon, like a greatest hits album of this decade's popular games. Whether jolting from cover to unload a clip into the gnashing maw of an angry dragon before dodging forward through his fireballs and using iframes to avoid the damage, or clearing massive procedural dungeons of trash mobs in search of upgrade materials, it's hard not to feel as though you are playing the bastard child of Dark Souls and Gears, with a Destiny and Diablo genes spliced in for good measure. Far from diminishing the finished product, the esoteric delivery of a mythopoetic story, deliberate, offensive and defensive options, top-notch shooting, and an enchanting aesthetic, all inspired by its predecessors, are employed here by Gunfire Games in service to an artistic conception we could not find more beautiful and endearing, even if execution of the idea is inconsistent in select places. Remnant takes place on a ruined earth some decades into the future, seceding an invasion of Earth by an interdimensional race. Incidentally, the title takes place immediately after the story of a previous gunfire title called Kronos. After learning from human allies that the root invasion was facilitated by attempts to bridge the internet dimensional space between worlds, the player sets out to cleanse not only Earth but to quash the interdimensional infection at its source. An antagonistic entity known as the Devourer, presumably the intelligence governing the root, manipulated the protagonist of Kronos into becoming his dreamer, a kind of portal between worlds, allowing the root to broach the barriers protecting Earth. The protagonist penetrates to the labyrinth, a nexus connecting the various dimensions, whose custodian informs us of other afflicted worlds to which we must travel in search of the founder of War 13, that is, our home base, presumably the only one to understand the nature of the root and how to defeat them. The story is sparsely presented, with very few cutscenes, most dialogue being optional, and the very real possibility existing of bypassing the story altogether if attention is not paid. As we mentioned in the past, we much prefer this over exposition. The game universe is afforded an air of objectivity and independent life by the impression that it exists without and beyond our perception of or participation in it. A sheer sense of wonder at witnessing new worlds as varied as they are vast, you know, high-tech dungeons stretched beneath the surface of a devastated nuclear desert, demon trees sprout roots into the sewers and subway tunnels below towering, decaying skyscrapers, you know, uncovering what happened amongst the dimensional locales in each location visited, and the desire to understand the nature of the root compelled us inexorably towards the story's conclusion. Moreover, the game avoids becoming an emotive, merely human tale a la God of War 2018, and instead contents itself with themes of cosmic flourishing and decay, and the ruination of the natural order by hubris and power lust. The game becomes, rather than a relatable, moralizing exercise in banality, a kind of problem ecology for the exploration of fundamental reality, value not for didactic reasons, but because nothing is more real or beautiful. Being is transnatural. Finite things tend beyond themselves as they are perfected, first towards their ultimate actualities as the heart toward pumping blood and bees to their hive, and finally beyond their own natures as matter in the biological or evolutive process. You look at your face in the mirror and it is changed. You exercise to build and as a requirement must tear muscle. Learning and working makes you tired and consumes calories reaped of other living things. Plants grow, flower, and are consumed and reconstituted for nutritive value by an animal. Animals in turn are perfected, reproduce, and are themselves consumed or evolved upon by higher order species. Nothing can be finite and change or become without digestion and suffering on the part of the changed thing. There is in fact an antinomy or tension between every finite thing and its progression and perfection beyond itself. Remnant, like the soul's titles by which it is inspired, takes place in the primary world in that its themes and mechanics exhibit and reinforce this trans transnaturality of being the digestion and shedding that precedes integration and perfection. Hence the invasion of Earth precipitated by transcending the bounds of our dimension, the nuclear toll required to purge the root from wrong, the humanity lost by Evelyn to merge with and understand the root. Tolkien can say that the primary world of elves and men is the same, if differently valued, because the good artist adorns a primary fundamental aspect of being, something infinitely more than his art, with a sort of different material appearance. His creation is but a possible historic realization of transcendent beauty. Remnant depicts, like Bioshock, a world afflicted by the tragic consequences of men coveting a divine likeness as regards knowledge of good and evil. Namely, that by their own natural power they might decide what they are, what was good, and what was evil for them to do. All this being said, there are still moments of human warmth to be found on this dying earth. 
a protracted optional conversation with an old man inhabiting a crashed plane in a tree, affords not only lore details and a useful item, but also his laments that the player character is probably the closest thing to a son he will ever have. The decaying world of Remnant is presented in an art style, palatable as that of Vigil Games and inspired by the comic artist Joe Maderera. The members of Vigil Games went on to constitute Gunfire Games in 2014 after the closure of THQ some years ago. A Darksiders vibe is immediately evident, with the game conveying the sense, as others have remarked, of Darksiders from the point of view of survivors. Remnant eschews hyperrealism in favor of a slightly cartoonish visual tone and smooth edges. The game is wonderful to observe in action. Different bright colors punctuate the gray or brown ruination of visited worlds. Enemy and character movements are exaggerated, visibly animated and telegraphed, and there is a staggering environmental and enemy variety on show here. Four main areas, including Earth, are populated by over 100 kinds of enemies and over 20 bosses, according to the game's official marketing and our own experience. Nor are these merely reskins. The variety on show is actually quite impressive. Individual enemy models in all cases. Typical fantasy sci-fi fare like dragons and insectile monsters are here alongside shambling, irradiated beasts, undying kings inspired by ancient Egypt, Lovecraftian entities, and their worldly devotees. This variety arises in part from one of Remnant's key innovations on the formula it appropriates from other games, semi-procedural generation of the game world. While each of the four main areas contain key tiles and central components, the game generates connections between essential areas, as well as dungeons, from a pool of tiles peculiar to each world. Moreover, each generated game world will contain only two mini bosses and one main boss, from a selection of many more, necessitating multiple playthroughs to see them all. As each boss and dungeon afford the player a unique weapon or piece of gear, there is great incentive to revisit even completed areas again by joining the game of other players or re-rolling one's own world. Replayability is further compounded by the fact that no role of the game world will be the same. It is not possible to become overly comfortable with enemy placement and progress routes as in Soul. This is not quite worth sacrificing the handcrafted nature and meticulous construction of Soulsborn levels. Though the payoff in terms of ease of development and replayability are, cre are clear and not a total net negative for the game. The only section where procedural generation of levels was apparent was in the sewers or underground dungeons, with dead ends and useless junctures swiftly dispelling our suspension of disbelief. ARPG and Destiny inspirations are also prolific on dungeon and level design. Rather than traversing carefully constructed zones intended to communicate important info about the world, players barrel through labyrinthine interlocking zones densely interspersed with enemies. Playing solo, this demands careful movement and cautious attempts to aggro small groups. But in co-op, the experience is closer to Diablo 3, as players joyously get ahead of each other in a race to down enemies and reach the end of the dungeon. As stated, the trade-off is not quite worth it, though the end result is enjoyable in a different way. We merely lament the slight feeling of formlessness and the opportunity to glean info about the world sacrificed in the name of replayability. Fuck. Remnant's other key innovation is in its wildly successful adaptation of Soulsborne iframe-based evasion and deliberate, challenging gameplay to third-person shooting combat. This has been attempted before with mixed results, mostly in Immortal Unchained uh, earlier this year. No game has, to our knowledge, accomplished the task quite as well as Remnant. It is impossible to overemphasize just how good it feels to roll, run, and shoot your way through hordes of disturbing enemies. Each gun I have personally tried packs a punch and feels radically different from others, with applications for each springing to mind as they are encountered. After running a close-range build for most of the game, it eased my completion of a challenging mid-late game boss fight to swap my shotgun for something capable of dropping ads from across the room. Contrarily, the sniper rifle that served me so well across the wasted cityscapes of Earth as nestled in buildings, I took pot shots on enemies patrolling the streets below, had to be exchanged for my shotgun in the cramped dungeon spaces beneath the deserts of Rom. I have since settled into an incredibly versatile build consisting of an alien pistol, shooting insect dots and exploding bullets for crowd control, with a burst rifle for long range. This is not a loot shooter. Weapons are not disposable, with each filling a certain battlefield role, though in a single playthrough it might be a grind to upgrade more than one or two guns. As with bosses who drop them or an item to craft them, the player will only see some of the available pool of weapons on a single run through the game. The form of movement the game depicts and the player participates in is one of high stakes, with reward and transcendence separated from abject failure by just a few mistimed button presses or observational negligence. 
The possibility of success is omnipresent and the player has the ability to avoid all damage in the game with only his own inadequacy separating him from success. With the artwork, the gameplay is a suitable, sensible symbol to convey the universe and conception of Remnant. Players are first and foremost required to grapple with the fact that their defeat stemmed from an error on their part, a failure to observe and comprehend discrete actions as organized expressions of the enemy's form, just the sort of failure that precipitated the root invasion of Earth. Souls inspirations abound, but Souls this is not. As mentioned in a recent Skill Up interview, Unlike Sekiro in Souls, Remnant decidedly does not demand that the player fail multiple times to learn untelegraphed enemy attack patterns. Here, each and every attack, by bosses and trash mobs alike, is preceded by an obvious tell in audio cue. There are no sneak attacks or cheap slashes without wind-ups you are expected to remember after dying to them once. It is entirely possible to reactively avoid every enemy attack in the game by careful deployment of iframes based on enemy and boss telegraphs. Rolling as a rhythm to it, with vulnerable pauses between each evasive maneuver, rendering it impossible to roll spam out of danger, and retaining exactly the right element of Souls-like combat. The satisfaction that comes from systems mastery and owned reaction time. The game is still incredibly challenging, but unlike FromSoft games, the barrier of entry is lessened by the lack of requirement the player fail in order to learn and progress. Our only major complaint concerns where Remnant is decidedly inferior to Souls not merely different, and that is boss design. This is not to say that there aren't some exciting boss fights with captivating and beautiful monsters. We love in particular Singe the dragon with his boss arena laden with crumbling buildings that become destroyed as the player seeks to cover behind them, or the Clavager, a looming biomechanical monstrosity straight from the fucking mind of H.R. Geiger. Our complaint, rather, is with how difficulty is ratcheted up in boss encounters via the use of ad mobs. This approach is not unprecedented in MMO-style offerings like Destiny, Though even there, the player is left feeling that bosses are difficult not in themselves, but for the overwhelming presence of distractions. This is an understandable design choice, preventing players from remaining at a safe distance and sniping bosses to death. However, many bosses, like the Undying King and Kanker, possess gap-closing moves and myriad range attacks that could have been reworked to achieve a similar difficulty by more refined means. To conclude, Remnant not only competently imitates the conventions of contemporary games, but suborns them as matter to a novel, beautiful, and enjoyable creative idea that any fan of Souls-like third-person shooting games, cosmic themes, or even mythopoetic storytelling would do themselves a disservice to miss. We give it a 9 out of 10.